to begin our worship service today. I am so glad that you have chosen to join us today as we worship our Lord and Savior. I hope that as you made your way into the sanctuary today that you picked up a bulletin. We have many things that God is doing in our midst and we don't want you to miss out on any of it. But first of all, if you are a guest here at Highland Park, we are so glad that God brought you here. We know that he has a purpose in store for you. And we just want to encourage you to take that bulletin. On the back, you'll see a QR code. 
If you would just scan that, that would let us know that you are visiting with us, and we would love to just reach out to you and see how we can be a blessing to you, pray for you, and answer any questions you have about what God's doing here at Highland Park. Also, please be aware that uh, we are going to be celebrating in a, in a powerful way uh, uh, through the act of baptism. In just a little bit, Pastor Darrell is going to lead uh, four individuals through the waters of baptism, and we get to celebrate with that, seeing how God is transforming lives and doing a great work in our midst. And so we are excited to witness that. Also, we are excited because our new student pastor is with us uh, today. This is his first uh, day with us, our first Sunday with us, I should say. And uh, I'm sure Pastor Darrell will share a little bit more about uh, Pastor Zach, but we are so glad to have Pastor Zach and Courtney and little baby Liam with us. And we know that God is going to do some amazing things in and through their ministry here at Highland Park. Uh, also, uh, please make sure that you uh, jot in your calendar that tonight at 6 o'clock, we will be beginning our Vacation Bible School. And uh, we are going to be focusing in on how uh, God has given us through His Word and through the Holy Spirit a biblical worldview, a way of seeing the world and a way of standing up for His truth, even in the midst of competing worldviews all around us that try to pull us away from God. And so this is going to be a powerful VBS for our children, but also for our adults. And so there is something for every age group uh, at VBS, and so we hope that you'll come out. We have our adult uh, class that will be in the fellowship hall, and we hope that you'll be uh, in attendance there. And we also have a parenting class uh, for uh, those who are trying to train up their children uh, in a biblical worldview to stand up for the truths of Christ. And so that will be in the educational building, second floor, uh, room 208, and I'll be leading that, and I hope to uh, see you there for that. So uh, again, even if you cannot come to Vacation Bible School this week, we hope that you'll be in prayer that God will do some amazing things uh, in the lives of the children, the adults, and the volunteers to expand his kingdom. Also, you'll notice that in your bulletin, there is a handout. It looks much like this. This is for the WMU All-American Meal. We hope that you'll take that handout, that you'll fill it out, and then you can place that in uh, any of the offering boxes uh, at the exits of the sanctuary, and that will let us know uh, how uh, to serve you for that All-American Meal on July the 2nd. And then lastly, uh, I, we just want to encourage you that deacon nominations are coming up very soon. And so we have uh, four uh, deacons that will be rotating off and four new deacons who will be coming on. And we just ask that you would be in prayer about uh, who God would have uh, step onto that deacon body to help guide and, and direct our church in the days ahead. So please uh, keep that in your prayer uh, as we move forward. But with that said, as we uh, continue on with our worship service, I would just like to lead us in a time of prayer and asking God's blessing upon our service here today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are good. And Lord, your blessings continue to abound each and every day. Father, we thank you for the wonderful work that you are doing here at Highland Park. Lord, we thank you that lives are being impacted for eternity. And Lord, that's because you are moving. Lord, you are working. And Lord, you get all the glory for it. Father, we thank you that as we come together today, Lord, to stand before your throne, to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, that we can do so also by celebrating the baptism that we are about to witness. And Father, we pray that each and individual uh, that is being baptized today, Lord, that you would watch over them, Lord, that you would guide them, and Lord, use them in a powerful way for your kingdom and for your glory. And we ask all of this in Christ's wonderful and holy name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Let me welcome each of you. What a great joy to see you today. Thank you for being here this morning. And we want you just to worship and feel the presence of God in this place. And it's such an incredible uh, way to begin our worship service this morning with uh, baptism. And we have a family of four, Chuck and Tanya Height, their ch children, uh, Jared and Cassie, will be baptized. And what a special day to see an entire family baptized at the same time. And we just love this family. We celebrate God bringing them into, uh, into our Highland Park family. So you pray for them as they come today. Cassie, you come right on. All right, this is, uh, this is Cassie Hyatt, 
And uh, Cassie and her family have been worshiping with us for some time, and we've just grown to know and love and appreciate them so very much, and just praise God for bringing them into our church family. So if you're here today as a special friend uh, or part of the family of Cassie, and you've come to support her, would you stand so we could recognize you this morning? Look at it over here. All over. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. You can be seated. Upon obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon Cassie's profession of faith, I baptize this my sister in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There you go. Okay, very good. You good? All right. Bless your heart. All right, this is Tanya. This is Cassie's mother. And again, we've just grown to know uh, and appreciate and love very much Tanya and the entire family. And again, I just can't say enough about uh, this family, what they mean to me, what they mean to our church family. So if uh, once again, you're here as part of her family and you've come to support her and the rest of her family today, would you stand so she could see you this morning? See that? All right. (laughs) Very good. Thank you so much. Upon obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon Tanya's profession of faith, I baptize this my sister in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You good? good. All right, bless your heart, Tanya. Love you. All right, this is Jared. This is Tanya and Chuck's uh, son. We were having a contest in the back to see who's the tallest, and uh, he's got me just by a little bit. I told him if I knew that, I would have teased my hair this morning so I could have been a little taller. But uh, we praise God for Jared and for the entire family, and if you're here this morning to support them as part of their friends and family, would you stand so he could see you this morning? All right, all over there. Thank you so much. Upon obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon Jared's profession of faith, I baptize this my brother in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Excellent, Jared. All right, my friend. All right, and this is, this is Dad. This is Chuck, and uh, again, we are so grateful that God has brought Chuck and his entire family, or three of his children here, into our church family. We celebrate that, and, uh, or two of them right now, and we just praise God for Chuck and the entirety of his family. So if you are here as part of Chuck, uh, Chuck's uh, friends and family, and you're here to support him, would you stand so we could recognize you? All right, all over the place, Chuck. Praise God. Upon obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon Chuck's profession of faith, I baptize this my brother in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Very good. Excellent, Chuck. The Bible says there's still room, there's still water. If you've never made your decision for Christ, I want you to know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I want you to to come to faith in Christ if you've never done that. And I want to be able to help you. And if you need that, please let me know. And that's that's our desire. That's the desire of our church family. Let's pray together, together as our praise team comes to lead us in worship. Father God, thank you. For the great joy of being able to stir these baptismal waters today just gives us great joy, and we just celebrate with the Hyatt family. We pray, God, that you would bless them, and God, that as they connect with our Highland Park family, that they would each find a place of service, a place, Lord, where they would just get plugged in and just feel right at home. And God, we're just grateful that we still see you working in the way that you're working in our church family. So God, would you just meet with us as we are blessed to be able to gather in your name and worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand as we worship?
This next song we're doing is called Oh Church Arise. We've been doing it for a couple of weeks, but as we gear up, gear our hearts ready for Bible school, just want to remember what our Bible school theme is, talking about the armor of God, and that's exactly what this song talks about, how God has equipped us with his word to help us suit up for the spiritual battle that we face every day between good and evil. And we pray that you will come join us this week for Bible school, and if not, that you'll just be praying for just a wonderful week that the gospel will be shared and um, many people's lives will just be blessed through it, children and adults. So this song is called, Oh Church Arise. Oh Church Arise, let put your eyes Yeah. 
in the, there we go, in the book of Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3, while you're finding your place there, I do want to let you know what's coming up in the weeks ahead. Next Sunday, of course, is Father's Day. We want you to be here with us and worship with us as we, uh, as we uh, celebrate all of our dads. But then the following Sunday is June the 25th. And um, on that Sunday, God has put a message on my heart that I just have no other choice but to preach, and I'm going to do it on June the 25th. Of course, we all know what we're dealing with this month, with Pride Month, and you don't have to go far to hear the world's truth about that, but on June the 25th, I'm going to give you God's truth about all of that, and I want you to be here. I want you to come. I want you to bring friends with you, and uh, because it will be something a little bit different, um, at least from my preaching, I've asked, uh, we, we have children's church where small children can always be part of children's church, but I've asked Miss Kelsey if she would help or organize or put together a place for uh, our older children to be able to go at 8.30 and 11 o'clock out in the Family Life Center and because it probably wouldn't be age appropriate, but that's up to the parents. And if you want them to stay in the auditorium, that's up to you. Also, I've asked Pastor Zach to do the same thing for our teenagers, and they're welcome to stay in the auditorium based upon what mom and dad says, but if not, we'll have a class for them as well during the times of worship. But you put that on your calendar and you be praying for me that uh, I would truly represent the Lord on the 25th as I pray every time I stand to preach. So Ezra chapter 3, if you were with us last Sunday morning, You know that I preached a message from chapters 1 and 2 called Coming Home as the Jewish exiles were returning from Babylonian captivity to come back into the city of Jerusalem. Well, today we're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday and move into the third chapter, and we're going to look at a a message entitled Starting Over. So they're coming home, ready to rebuild, and they are starting over as the people of God preparing the place of God for the Jewish people for worship. Uh, It is... Seldom that we move through life without having conflict and difficulty and hardship. Life is not a series of one victory after the next, after the next, after the next. It's usually an ebb and flow of good and bad, ups and downs, uh, victories, and yes, sometimes failures. No doubt the ancient man Job felt that way. Uh, Sometimes our troubles are a result of bad decisions that we've made. Sometimes troubles are thrust upon us. But either way, we go through it. Job went through it. In fact, he said this in Job 17, my days have passed, my plans are shattered, and so are the desires of my heart. Let me give you that again from Job 17. My days have passed, my plans are shattered, and so are the desires of my heart. Maybe you have felt like that from time to time. Back in 1930, there was a professional golfer by the name of Buddy Mulligan One day on the very first tee as he hit his drive, he hit an errant shot, and it was just a terrible shot. And without any word spoken, he just bent over, put another ball on the tee, and he hit the ball again, and he told his friends, this is my correction shot. And that was in the 1930s, and we still call that what today, golfers? A mulligan. So if you ever play with me, you know I need a mulligan at every hole. Um, I take mulligans when I putt. I take mulligans when I chip. So anyway, in life, we all need mulligans from time to time. We need an opportunity to start over. We can refer to it as, as closing the door, as turning the page, as moving to the next chapter, as moving on. Whatever terminology you may want to use, but from time to time, everybody needs a time where they can start over. And it can be a time that is both frightening and exciting. And whichever it is, starting over is much better than staying in a place of defeat or despair. It is important that we move forward. And we're going to look this morning into the lives of these Hebrews and see that they did just that. The background, of course, is when um, King Cyrus issued the decree that the Jewish captives from Babylon were now free to return back home. They were to leave the protection of the Persian Empire, travel some 2,000 miles, spend about four months or so, four or five months traveling uh, desolate roads until they finally would arrive at the city of Jerusalem and begin to rebuild. They had been in captivity for 70 long years. Think about that, 70 decades. Most of them had never been to Jerusalem before. They had certainly never seen the city in all of its glory. There were a few of the older ones who 
were uh, kidnapped earlier uh, when they were indeed carried off to Babylonian captivity, but not a great deal of them. Most of them had never even been to Jerusalem before. But now they were going to get to go, and they were going to have the task of rebuilding the place of worship for God's people. Um, in chapter 2, if you recall from last Sunday morning, we looked at the list of names that God provides of all of the families that left Persia and Babylon and went back to Jerusalem. God did not forget a single one of them. Not a single family ever slipped his mind. He always knew exactly where every one of them was. And then he names the list for us. And if you read through that list, you will find out there were about 50 thousand Jewish people who came back to Jerusalem during this first wave. You see, there were actually three waves of exiles that returned. Uh, the book of Nehemiah, the book of Ezra, chronicles those three waves. Ezra and Nehemiah used to be one book, and then the translator separated that into two. But in the book of Ezra, uh, the first wave leaves Persia comes to Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel, and they begin to build the Jewish temple. The second wave, which happens much, 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 much later, is led by Ezra, the author of this book, the author of the book of Chronicles, and also the author of Psalm 119. But Ezra leads the second wave. And as he leads the second wave, his focus is going to be on teaching the Word of God and discipling the people. And then there's a third and final wave recorded in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah leads this third wave, brings the captives, the remaining captives back, and then he builds the wall around Jerusalem. If you want to take it a step farther, there's another book that follows Nehemiah. We have Ezra, Nehemiah, what comes next? Esther. The book of Esther is a record of the Jewish people who decided to stay in Persia. So some of them never returned back to Jerusalem. So Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are truly pivotal books when you begin to talk about the history of the Jewish people. Had they messed up? Yes. That's why they were in Babylonian captivity. Had they disappointed God? Most definitely. In fact, God said the land should rest every year, every seventh year. They didn't allow the land to rest. So they owed God 70 Sabbath years. So for 70 years, the land was allowed to rest while the Jews were in captivity. So if anybody needed a mulligan, it was these Jewish exiles. If anybody needed to start over, it was this group of people. And I pray today that we can take it off the page and put it where we live. And you'll see this morning as I move through this, I'm going to give you three quick steps and I don't particularly preach how-to sermons or step sermons or those kind of things, but I, I do want to give you just this morning three quick steps that will help you if you need to start over. If you need a mulligan, if you need to turn the page, if you need to start a new chapter in your life, I'm going to give you three quick steps that I believe encompass uh, what it takes to really begin again with God and in God's work, and, and really even as a, as a as a human, all right? So let's look at this as we move through it. First of all, I want you to jot down, number one, connect yourself with God's people. If you really want a mulligan and a do-over and a start, a fresh start, I would begin by saying, start with connecting yourself with God's people. Here's what oftentimes happen, uh, happens. A person goes through a hard time or a struggle and they'll drop out of church. Because they're like, I just don't feel like going, or I feel like I'm a hypocrite when I'm there, or I've just got too much baggage, and they just quit going. Listen, for heaven's sake, when you're going through a time of trouble, the place above all places that you need to be is in God's house. Amen, church? But sometimes people will disconnect, and they will fall by the wayside when they're going, going through problems. So first of all, I want you to know, to get started again, connect with God's people. Look in verse 1. When the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities... The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. I have underlined in my Bible the words, they gathered themselves together. Do you know what they did? They connected with one another. They gathered themselves together. Go down to verse number 9. Notice the Bible says right in the middle of the passage, the sons of Judah together set forward the workmen in the house of God. They were connected together. They were working together. Go down to verse 11. You may want to underline this as well. They sang together. Isn't that a beautiful picture of these returning exiles? They work together. They serve together. 
They sang together. If you continue reading in verse number 11, the scriptures talk about how they praised God together. For 70 years in a foreign land, exiles living in a strange country, now finally they are allowed to return, and how do they come back? Not as a one-man band, not as a one-man show, not isolated individuals, but as a body. They were connected with each other because their strength in numbers. They needed each other. They depended upon each other. They would help one another. They loved and they prayed for one another, and they remained connected to each other, to the people of God, and together they were connected to God. Do you know the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came to indwell believers, that the disciples were gathered together in the upper room. They were gathered together. They were connected with one another. And the genesis of the New Testament church finds its origin in the fellowship and in the ingathering of God's people, not just isolated individuals, but people who are gathered together in God's family. 1 Corinthians 3 says, we are laborers together with God. Now let me ask you, have you ever heard someone say, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian? Have you ever heard someone say that? We've all probably heard that. You don't have to go to church uh, to be a Christian. Technically, technically that is correct. But I want to qualify that by saying if you are truly a born-again child of God, you will have that desire to assemble together on the Lord's day and connect with the rest of the body of Christ. You will have that desire. You will have that eagerness. You will have that want to. You say, well, Pastor Darrell, there are just too many imperfect people at the church. Listen, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go to it because you'll ruin it, all right? There are no perfect churches. There are no perfect people. We are all a work, in a, progress, a work in progress, not a hotel for saints, but a hospital for sinners. And we are all here in this place to try to learn to become more like the Lord Jesus. None of us have arrived. By the way, someone who says, well, you know, I don't want to go because there might be hypocrites here or hypocrites there. What are they really saying? They're saying the rest of the people in all the other churches in the world haven't attained to the standard that I've attained to. Really, it's pride when you think about that, isn't it? And I just threw that in. That's a little bit extra. Won't cost you anything, though, all right? So we've all heard it said that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But you know, when you come together, you sing together, you work together. You worship together. You praise God together. You are connected one to another as co-laborers. Psalm 50 says, gather my saints together, those that have made a covenant with me. There were times in Jewish history when the nation of Israel was far from together. We call it the years of the divided kingdom. They were divided in a civil war from the north to the south. We studied about that in the book of Judges and the books of Samuel. And that was a divided kingdom, not a united kingdom. But the devil, when he works, what he does is he works to divide and then he works to destroy. And that's exactly what he did to the nation of Israel. He divided the kingdoms and then with Nebuchadnezzar, he allowed him to come in and just wipe the slate clean of the Jewish people. He will do it in a, he will do it in a situation like Israel. He will do it in a marriage the devil will work to divide the husband and the wife. And if he can do that, he will work then to destroy the marriage union. He will do it in a church. He will work to divide people. And if he can divide people and get some on one side and others on the other side, then what he's doing is gaining a foothold in that congregation that will diminish the reputation of that church in the community. So to say that you don't have to be connected to each other to be a Christian uh, I, think, I think in reality is kind of like an oxymoron. Think about, think, about, think about this for just a moment. I shared this in the first service this morning. The idea of being disconnected with a church family is a foreign biblical model. You just don't see that in the Scripture because listen. Listen to the contrast. Let's worship together. What is the contrast of that? I worship all by myself. Let's sing together. What's the contrast? I'm singing alone. Let's praise God together. 
What's the contrast? I praise God alone. Let's give together. Let's pull our resources and give together. The contrast is, no, I'll just give to the causes that I think deserve my resources. Let's fellowship together. The contrast, no, I'll just fellowship all by myself. Do you see, listen, do you see the insanity behind that? That's not the biblical model. The text tells us these Jewish people, when they came back from Babylon, that they were working together and serving together and singing together and praising God together. It is a beautiful thing to see a husband and wife sitting on a pew together in worship service with a Bible opened, and they're growing together. It blesses my heart to see teenagers, young people, come into God's house, and they're growing together, and they're serving together, and they want to learn more and more about God. Together we are a church family. Together we're the body of Christ. Together we're to, to connected to one another. And we hold the church in high regard. We hold the Word of God in high regard. We hold the, the public declaration, the preaching of the Word of God. We hold it in high regard. And all that we do, listen, we do it together. We're connected one to another. I heard about a a young lady in worship service one Sunday who had a six-year-old little boy who was just as fidgety as he could be, like he, had, he was a worm in hot ashes, and he just couldn't sit still, and he couldn't be quiet, and she would warn him, and she'd point at him, and she would, she would kind of reach over and pinch him, and she'd try to get him to settle down, and he was just as fidgety as he could be. And finally, she reached over, and she, she very quietly whispered something in his ear, and when she did, he sat up like a soldier and never flinched the remainder of the service. A friend of hers who was sitting behind her in the pew said, I noticed what happened in the service, and I'm just curious, what did you say to him that made him pay attention like that? She said, well, I told him if he didn't sit still and be quiet, that the preacher was going to lose his place and have to start his sermon all over again. <laughs> so listen, if I see any of you dozing on me, I'm going to start my sermon all over again. I just say, I just say, listen, I know, I know it can be a struggle to wrestle small children. That doesn't worry me at all. You let them fidget. That's all right. What better place to see a child fidget than in God's house? Isn't that right? Don't worry about that. If they're making a little bit of noise, I can preach better or I can preach louder, I guess, than, than they, than they can, can fidget. So don't you worry about that. You just bring your children, bring your families, and together we want to grow and be connected with God. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. So, Connect yourself with God's people if you want a mulligan. That's where you start. That's how you start over. Secondly, conform yourself to God's word. Let's follow this and kind of track it in verse 2. Then stood up Joshua, the son of Josadek, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheliathil, and his brethren, and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Now, not only were they working together, serving together, singing together, praising God together, but they were doing that in conformity with what Moses had written and outlined in the Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that would guide their lives. Moses gave them the instructions for the building of the first temple or the first uh, tabernacle, then eventually the temple. He gave them the instructions about uh, offering sacrifices on the altar. And now that they had been gone from the whole homeland for 70 years, they are now returning and they are bringing with them God's Word that will guide them, that will direct them, and that will lead them. What they have to do is conform their lives to what God was teaching in His Word. It's the same for us today. We never judge circumstances or we never judge the Word of God by circumstances. We always judge circumstances by what God has to say about those circumstances and situations. We call that being conformed to the, to the Word of God. We don't stand in judgment over God's Word. We stand under the authority of God's Word, and God is the judge, and His Word is the ultimate authority. Amen, church? And like I said, the world has all kinds of truth, but there's really only one truth, and that is God's truth. So these Jews returning from exile were learning God's truth and they were conforming their lives to the truth of God's word. And every, 
aspect of rebuilding this city and this temple, they obeyed it because it was outlined in God's Word. Let me show you. Go to verse 3. They set up the altar upon its basis. Now, why did they do that? Because the law had said, this is the way you do it. Um, For fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon to the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. Why did they do that? Because that's the way the law had prescribed that they do it. Go to verse 4. They kept the feast of the tabernacles, for it is written and, uh, and offered the daily burnt offering by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. Why did they do that? Why did they rebuild the altar? Why did they start the sacrificial system again? Why did they keep the Feast of Tabernacles? It's because that's what was outlined in the Scripture, and they were conforming themselves to what God had said. In fact, that Feast of Tabernacles, it's called Sukkot, uh, the, the Hebrew festival of Sukkot. It was one of the festivals that the Jewish people would celebrate every year. And it was a way to, to celebrate how God had provided them with provision as they were moving through the Sinai desert after they left Egyptian bondage hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. And how when they were hungry, God gave them manna from heaven. You remember that in the Old Testament, these wafers that just look like what the Bible calls its angel food? God would just bring that every morning. And then uh, when they were thirsty, God would bring to them water from the rock. Because of that event, every year as part of Jewish worship, they would celebrate Sukkot, the time that God supernaturally fed them in the wilderness. And when he gave them the water from the rock, In fact, in John chapter 7, the Lord Jesus stood up at the feast of Sukkot, at the feast where they celebrated God sending water from the rock, and the Lord Jesus, as the rock of ages, stood up, and he says, if any man is thirsty, let him come and drink of me. He that believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And while I'm here, just let me say, if you are under the sound of my voice this morning, either here or You are watching our services live stream. If you have been drinking from the world's fountain and it's left you dry and thirsty, I want you to come to Jesus. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord, He is good. And if you will just commit your life to Him and love Him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, I want you to know you'll have the most peace, you'll have the most joy, you'll have the greatest purpose in life because you were created to know God. And He loves you and invites you to know Him. So, don't swallow what the world offers. Just live your life for the Lord. As these Jews were coming back, they wanted to start over. They needed a mulligan. And they wanted to turn the page. And as they did, they rebuilt the altar. They instituted the sacrifices. And they, now they began to rebuild the temple. Verse 5 says, They offered continual burnt offering of the new moons and all of the feast of the Lord that were consecrated and everyone that willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord from the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money to the masons, to the carpenters, Uh, and food and uh, to buy food and drink and oil to them of uh, Sidon and to them of Tyre and to bring cedar trees from Lebanon the sea of Joppa according to the grant that uh, they had of Cyrus the king of Persia so the people worked together they joined together they sang together they served together they they uh, were connected one to another And they were conforming to one to another based on how God in his word was leading their lives. Now remember, it had been roughly a a thousand years since Moses had written what he did in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Roughly a thousand years. But when these Jewish people come back into the homeland, what is the first thing they do? Is they get God's word and they say, we want to know what God's expectations of us are. And they begin to be, rebuild the altar, offer the sacrifices, celebrate the feast times just as prescribed as God. If I could give anyone any, any just spiritual godly advice, as a, if you're a young person especially today, but it goes for anybody, 
If you will look to God and turn to God for the direction of your life, you will not regret that when you get older. Amen, church? I mean, if you will just let God lead you, let God lead you in whom you date, let God lead you in whom you ultimately marry, let God lead you in the path that you choose for a a career and where you go to school, and do as much as you can to try to follow God's outline for your life. And, And you won't regret that when you get older. In fact, you'll be the better for it. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you can build your life in one of two ways. He said, you can build your life on the shifting sands of life, but when the rains come and the winds blow, your life will fall because there's no foundation. But if you will build your life upon the rock of Christ, upon His teachings, upon His Word, and conform your life to what He says, let the storms come, let the winds blow, and let the rains fall, and you will never fall because you're built on Jesus and He's never going down. So these New Testament or Old Testament Jewish people They were connected to one another, and they were connected to God. And then they were conforming themselves to God's Word. So if you want to start over and have a mulligan, connect yourself with God's people, and then conform yourself to God's Word. And then thirdly, I want you to jot down, commit yourself to God's work. Commit yourself to God's work. Once they got the altar in place, once they got the sacrifices in place, they start with the temple. Go to verse 8. In the second year of their coming to the house of God in Jerusalem, it had been now two years since King Cyrus had allowed them to be free. In the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Sheliathiel, and Joshua, the son of uh, Josedach, And the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they were that were come out of the captivity under Jerusalem, they appointed Levites from 20 years old upward, now look at this, to sit forward the work of the house of the Lord. To set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Do you know what he is saying there? Is that not only would they be connected to God's people, not only would they be conformed by what God has to say, but that they would also commit themselves to God's work. And a great place to start with a mulligan is to have a fresh commitment with God that your passion is going to be to work in God's kingdom. You see, these Hebrews, they labored, they worked, they sweated together, they pushed, they pulled together. They supported each other and loved each other and prayed for each other to take this pile of rubble in the city of Jerusalem and transform it into a place where the presence of God would reside. Tonight, we start Vacation Bible School, as you have heard announced. And I want to already say a word of thank you for what you've already done for Vacation Bible School. If you've been in our Family Life Center this morning, you've seen how many of the rooms have been decorated, how the, the gymnasium itself has been decorated, because people have given of themselves and they've come to make that happen, to be a blessing to the children and to the families that are in our community. So I want to thank you for that. But also, there is a place for you tonight and every night this week if, as you can come. It is a great outreach to our community. And God is blessing our church in an incredible fashion. And sometimes it seems like it's hard to stay ahead of what God's doing. But you know, when you really look at the big picture, we have so many folk in our church who are serving, and they serve in incredible ways, and they sacrifice themselves because they're committed to the work of God. In our education department, we have folk who are teaching Sunday school and assisting Sunday school teachers. We have folk in our music ministry and and in our children's ministry and in our students' ministry and in our college ministry, just one right after the other. We have people who serve on committees. We have people who serve as deacons. We have people who drive golf carts and shuttle our folk around. We have people who work security. Listen, we have a lot of folk who serve here in our church but there's always room for one more and one more and one more. If you feel like today, you know, I just want to turn a page in my life and I want to start over. Listen, you let me know. We can always use, we can always use more people who can help in children's church or in nursery or in other kinds of ministries here at the church that God may have gifted you to serve. You just let us know, all right? And we'll put you to work. Charles Haddon Spurgeon 
once said, it is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus. Isn't that great? It is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus because he has done so much for us. He died for us. The least we can do is live for him and work in his kingdom. So, as these Jewish exiles return home, and as they begin this great building project, I want you to know that it did not go without difficulty. In fact, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I do want to show you a couple of verses in the fourth chapter of what happens in this story. They begin this project, and as soon as they begin this, there is incredible opposition. Go to chapter 4, look in verse 4. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all of the days of Cyrus of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. They were working to stop what God was trying to do through these Babylonian or these Jewish exiles now returning home. In fact, they even wrote an ugly letter to King Artaxerxes explaining why the building should stop. And anytime you do anything for God, I want you to know the devil is not going to let you do it without opposition. He will send somebody along that will hurt your feelings. And maybe they didn't even know that they hurt your feelings with something they said. And they didn't intend it that way. Maybe it was just the way you received it. But you got your feelings hurt, so you just decided to quit. Or maybe it's a, it's a time where your priorities have been misplaced, so you've just decided to quit. And many folk who should be committed to the work of God have decided to quit. Now, may I say to you, the easiest thing in life to do is quit. Amen, church? Easiest thing that you can do is quit, but quitting becomes a habit. I used to tell my boys when they were growing up, guys, I don't care what it is in life, whatever you start, you're going to follow it through, and you're not going to quit because when you quit one thing, it gets easier to quit another and another, and then quitting becomes a way of life. These folk had every reason in the world to throw up their hands and to quit. And someone had written this ugly letter to King Artaxerxes and said, this is why you got to stop this, you got to stop this work of these Jewish people. In fact, the, the, the letter that they wrote is recorded for us in the Bible. It is in verses 11 all the way down to verse 16. We're not going to read that this morning, but that is actually the letter that they wrote to King Artaxerxes. I'm not going to read it, but you do see the results of what happened when he read that letter. Go to verse 23 of chapter 4. When the copy... Of king of the letter of excuse me. Now, when the copy of the king Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shemeshai, the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem under the Jews. Look at this now, and they made them to cease by force and power. They made them stop. You know how long that lasted? Eighteen years. Notice verse twenty-four. They ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius the king. For 18 years, they stopped. And what looked like the devil was winning at that time. And maybe you're here and you're thinking sometimes it does look like the devil is winning. But I have discovered over my years that if you will just let the devil, you just, give him his, you just give him the time and his people the time and they will punch themselves out. And you just let it be and you be above all of that stuff and you let critics criticize, you let haters hate, you let belly belly bellyache, you let powders pout, you just let all of that stuff go and you keep your eyes on Jesus and keep the main thing the main thing. That's the main thing around here. Amen, church? And you just keep looking to the Lord and he will bless you for doing that. So go back to Ezra 3. We'll land this thing and I'll show you how this ends. Ezra 3, look in verse number 9. Then stood Joshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Henadad, with their sons and with their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites and the son of Asaph and the symbols to, look at this now, praise the Lord after the ordinance of King David of Israel. That is, they organized a worship service. 
And when the foundations were laid, the people stopped and they gave thanks to God in public praise. Which means while we're doing what we're doing, we stop and we give praise to God for all that He's done. When you're in vacation Bible school this week and you feel like your room is full of kids and you're like it, you're trying to herd cats, just pause and just give praise to God. Amen? When you're dipping that food as fast as you can get it out to those hungry children and you think, man, I've got to go to work in the morning and I am going to be so give out, just stop and you just praise the Lord and God's going to reward you for that. Be committed to His work and you always get more from it, I believe, than really what we even put into it. That's just the way God works as He blesses us. So they stopped what they were doing. They were just praising the Lord. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Look at verse 11. Then they sang together by chorus and praising and giving thanks to the Lord. If you carry King James, what's those next four words? Or you can see it on the screen. Because he is good. Isn't that a wonderful passage of Scripture? Why do they stop? Why do they break out in spontaneous praise to God? Because the Lord is good. That in this moment... With the rubble of the city of Jerusalem still all around them, they began to work for two years in this building situation. And they stop and they just praise God from Psalm 100 because God is good. Listen to Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all ye lands and serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence in singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Praise him and be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So just praise God and thank him for all that he's done. All right? We're going to close. Two minutes. Say amen if you're listening. Here we go. Look in verse 12 at what happened. Many of the priests and the Levites and the chiefs of the fathers who were ancient men had seen the first house that was built by Solomon years and years earlier. And then when the foundation of this house was built, they leapt with a vow, wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard far off. As the exiles returned, most of them had never been to Jerusalem, but there were some older people who had been captured when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city and had been kidnapped and carried to Babylon 70 years earlier. Now they are maybe 80, 85, 90, 95 years old, and they're coming back, and when they see the foundation of that temple that is built, they begin to weep. Now some scholars say they weep because the Rubble's temple was not going to look like the glory of Solomon's temple. Perhaps that's why they wept, but I think it goes even deeper than that. I think after 70 years of exile, they're coming back and they're like, God is so good to bring us back to our home, to build us a place of worship where his spirit will come down and reside with us, that they just wept copious tears and praise and thanksgiving to God. And not only did the older people weep, the younger people, they shouted for joy. And it was like they were dancing in the street because you know what they all got? They all got a mulligan. They all got a, a do-over. They all got to turn the page, to start over, and to have a new chapter in their lives. And if you're here today, as we close this out, I want you to know that God in His grace offers to you a mulligan, a second chance, a third chance, a do-over. If you failed it the first time and you just made a disaster, God in His grace can give you that mulligan and he can bring you back to where you need to be. But you got to follow those simple steps. Connect yourself with the people of God. Conform yourself to the Word of God. And commit yourself to the work of God. Let's pray together. Lord, you've been so good to us. 
to start this service today with beautiful singing from our choir, to see a baptismal service, to have some wonderful time of, of congregational singing together, and then the, the preaching of your inspired, infallible word. God, it has been good to be in your house today. Help us now as we take this home with us that we're not simply hearers, but that we are doers of your word. As we have this invitation and we invite folk to make decisions, if there's one under the sound of my voice that has never made their decision for Christ, I pray that today they would come and say, yes, Pastor Darrell, I want to start my life over, and I want to start my life with Christ, or I want, to, I want to commit my life to the work of God, or I want to be baptized, or whatever that situation, I want to unite with a church family, I pray that they would come. So just take this invitation and use it in a way that will bring glory to you. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together.